As our children make their way to Children's Church, I want to take this occasion to express the church's appreciation uh, to so many of you who uh, gave so much time and love and energy to the preparation of uh, the uh, services yesterday conducted uh, for Terry Hill. Um, it's been a very difficult time in the life of our church to say goodbye to one so loved and so important to us. But the way this church has put its arms around the Hill family has been uh, quite uh, impressive. And I want to thank you all for the energy and effort you put into loving them uh, so well during this difficult time. I also want to uh, say a word of thank you once again to our men's ministry, who, if you are aware, uh, this past Saturday, yesterday, was the third time that they have gone and worked to help move uh, refugees in our area from very temporary housing to permanent housing. And they did that early uh, yesterday, and we're also very appreciative. I'd like to point out to you that in your order of service, you'll find these cards. You should all have found at least two cards in your order of service. Uh, they are for the purposes of your putting one on your refrigerator to remind you of the various services we'll be conducting during the Easter season. But secondly, we'd like you to take the other card and share it with a friend or a neighbor, a family member uh, that you'd like to invite to come and celebrate with us during the Easter season. So please uh, take advantage of these cards, take them with you this week, take them home and share them with someone soon. The scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the ninth chapter. And it's one of the longer, if not the longest, encounters recorded by the Gospels of Jesus with someone that he meets on his journeys. And in this particular instance, he is journeying and discovers on his journey a man, the scripture tells us, is blind from birth. And the purpose of this text, at least in part, is to think about or be reminded of the relationship between Jesus and what it means to see. In other words, the spiritual relationship between Jesus and seeing God at work. So Jesus meets a blind man who is blind from birth. And of course, as Jesus is traveling, his disciples are with him and they're following along. And as they come along with Jesus and they encounter this blind man from birth, it occasions a question. Because the disciples are with the rabbi and the rabbi is a teacher and the teacher is the one who can instruct them. And so they're looking to their teacher to instruct them concerning a blind man from birth because the question is, is this man blind because of the sin of his parents? Or is he blind because of his own sin? Again, the question is, is he blind because of the sin of his parents, or is he blind because of his own sin? Now, this was a live question in Jesus' day. It's this kind of thing that would come up and people would debate, and so the disciples rightly want to know the answer. And it shouldn't surprise you that when Jesus answers the question, he doesn't answer that question. He seldom does. In fact, he goes on to tell them that 
neither is it the man's parents' sin or his sin that's the cause of this man's blindness. To the contrary, to the contrary, Jesus says, it is so that the works of God might be displayed in him. It is so because the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, he removes entirely removes entirely the question of whether it's sin or not sin of one particular person or another. That is the cause of this. And we would be mistaken if we were to think that when his disciples ask about who caused this or is this a result of, they're not talking about the kind of cause that we might think about. You know, how one thing might cause another, like this action caused this result, or this disease might cause, cause these symptoms. No, this is an entire framework. This is an entire orientation that the disciples are bringing to bear in their understanding of the blind man, which Jesus is saying you have to surrender, that it doesn't apply, that it makes no sense. You're looking at the man through lenses that do not apply in this case. If you want to know what's going on here, it's not about this man and his parents or himself or anybody else. It's about what God's up to. And of course you might go, no, 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 no. Are you saying that God caused this man to be blind? Jesus doesn't say that either. In other words, he's not saying that the man's blindness is caused by anything. He's not giving an assessment of the origins of the man's illness or infirmity. He's inviting his followers, his disciples, his disciples who are caught up in a way of thinking, an entire ideology, if you will, a spiritual ideology in which they're caught up. He's inviting them to think differently than how they've thought so far. And when he begins to do that, he informs them that these things are so, that the works of God might be revealed or might be displayed. And so Jesus goes on to, to meet the man, not as a sinner, but one who is deserving of care and love and help. He takes mud and he spits in it and he puts it on the man's eyes. And he sends the man off to the well, to the pool. And he discovers in his obedience to Jesus healing in his body. And of course, when he returns with the excitement of this healing, people who know him are astonished. The disciples are astonished. His neighbors are astonished. His parents are astonished. And if we read further down, the Pharisees are astonished. Something has happened here that nobody anticipated. And Jesus is using the moment to teach them something they did not know. Something that, shall we say, they needed to be delivered from. But up to this point, were unable to see. His disciples could not see. The neighbors could not see. The Pharisees could not see. They were blind 
to the works of God. And so Jesus assists them in reframing their understanding of the blind man. Sometimes it takes something astonishing to lay the groundwork for a new way of seeing, a new way of appreciating the world, a new way of understanding what God's up to. I, I, had, a, I had a very good friend. I have a very good friend in Atlanta. Uh, he grew up in Florida. He grew up in rural Florida, and he grew up uh, fairly poor. And as he grew up, his grandmother did what many good grandmothers do. Uh, she taught him well about the love of God. And he was well aware of it. But as he grew older, his attention turned to other things. For example, being a very good football player. In fact, he was good enough to get a scholarship to go to a small college. And he played football there, and he did relatively well. And he learned relatively well. And he knew he wasn't going on in football, but he could see. He had enough exposure to know that if he wanted to, shall we say, get on in life, he was going to have to prepare himself to do so. And so he decided at the end of his college career that he would try to go to law school. Because he saw that, at least back in those days, going to law school meant you could probably do fairly well. You could make some money. And so he went to law school. And the first year he was in law school, one weekend a friend of his asked him to take something that was his, take it back to Florida. He's like, sure, no problem. So he does. He takes it for his friend. He takes it to Florida, and then he comes back to school, to law school. And when he sees his friend the next time, when he sees his friend the next time, his friend gives him an envelope with thousands of dollars in it. He's like, really? Just for taking a package to Florida? No problem, friend. I got another one for you next week. And it wasn't too long before he discovered very quickly that he could make much, much, much more money, much quicker and much easier than if he stayed in law school. And it wasn't too many years before he was a kingpin in the southeast for the distribution of cocaine. Not too many years. And not too many years after he had established himself as such, did he find that such a business was a pretty dangerous game. And one night, someone tried to shoot him point blank. And when he did, he knew that he was shot. There was even blood under his t-shirt. And in horror and in pain, he rushed to the emergency room. And when he got to the emergency room, and they got him on the gurney, and the doctors raised his T-shirt, there's no gunshot wound. And so astonished was he, and so arresting was this moment, and so remarkable and miraculous was that moment, that he began to remember the things that his grandma had taught him about God and God's way. And from that moment on, he determined that his life was going to go in another direction. Let's just say he got a whole new view on life. He was 
ready to live in a very different light. He could see differently now than he could before. And so like you might imagine, he gave himself to God and eventually went into the Christian ministry. In fact, he was my pastor for five years when I lived in Atlanta. Just last summer, he got his Doctor of Ministry degree and is doing tremendous work in that city. But look what it takes. Look what it took. And Jesus says over and over and over again, you believe because you saw signs. Blessed are those who believe and do not have signs. In other words, must it be a tragedy? Or must it be a miracle? Is that what it's going to take for you to see or see differently? Because friends, if you don't know, we all live with these lenses, these spectacles, these perspectives, these ideologies of the lies we lead that, that cause us to see the world in a certain way. We have our own biases towards the world. Jesus' disciples believed that that man must be blind from birth because of sin of either his parents or himself. It's got to be one or the other, right? Jesus says no. But we have our own ideologies, our own lenses we're wearing. I'll just share three with them. The first one is our radical autonomy, our alleged freedom. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is, it's, well, it's my house, it's my job, they're my kids, it's my retirement. I'll make decisions about what to do in my house. I'll make decisions about what to do with my kids. I'll make decisions about what to do with my retirement. And I'm going to ask the Lord to help me. I'm just going to ask God to come along and help me with what I've decided it's all going to be about. I've decided what I'll care about. And we'll ask God to help us when we decide. Because that's what God's for. If you don't know, God works for us, right? Yeah. Well, there's another one. It's quite common. Fear. Some people live their entire lives behaving, acting, making choices out of fear or anxiety. They always see the next danger around the corner. Even though they can't see around the corner, it must be one, right? Whatever's next must be somehow. And so we stay scared all the time. We make choices out of fear. We're anxious. And there are people who would love to help you be anxious. Why? Because they'll sell you something to help you get over it. They'll either come up with a scheme or sell you a pill. But they won't tell you that it shouldn't be that way. They'll tell you that's the way it is and you have to live that way and we'll find a way for you to get over it and you'll have to pay me for the privilege. It's another ideology we suffer from. One more. I really like this one. It's not mine. I borrowed it from somebody I live with. 
He's pretty smart too. Willful ignorance. Christians, followers of Jesus, the one whom we claim to be the truth, we willfully don't want to know stuff. We willfully work at not knowing about things. We willfully choose not to engage our time or our intellect or our resources to know. Why? Because it might cause us to have to do something other than what we're doing. And we're either pretty comfortable or too fearful or too possessive to change. So we don't want to know. We don't want to know. And Jesus says, but that's not the kind of seeing. Those are not the lenses. That's not the perspective to which you've been called. I'm calling you to surrender those lenses. I'm calling you to join the Lions Club. You know the Lions Club? You know, they raise um, money to, to help people overcome blindness. And so people turn in their lenses. Jesus wants you to turn all those lenses in. Right? He wants you to take them and drop them off at the distribution center. He wants you to lay them aside or get rid of them. Or dare I even say it, did anybody see on Sports Center the woman who took her glasses and just crushed them up because her son lost a wrestling match? Anybody see that? Yes, a mother, a mother watching her son lose a wrestling match got so angry she took her glasses off and she just crushed them. <laughs> if you don't believe me, look it up when you get home. It's all there. Maybe I'm looking at Facebook too much. I don't know. <laughs> it's a possibility. I don't know how to do TikTok, but I guess it comes through. Oh, okay, that one. What she said. My point is, God wants us to take those things off and to crush them and be done with it. And to give ourselves to a kind of seeing so that no matter what comes your way, you see that this is so, that the works of God might be displayed. Whether it's good or bad coming in your life, that thing is so that the works of God might be displayed. God didn't bring that there, but he's given you the vision to see what he might do in it. And through it. No matter how hurtful or tragic or difficult or not right something is, in it, through it, so that the works of God might be displayed. No matter how good or wonderful, let's just say you've got the most wonderful house in the world. Why do you have it? So that the works of God might be displayed. Huh? My house? Yes. The home you live in, the car you drive, the life you live, the retirement account you have. Yes. That's right. So that the works of God might be displayed. I'll give one more example and then I'll hush. When I was a kid... My mother, as was her role, often was at the sink doing dishes. And I don't remember what I was up to, but she told me that you could glorify God in anything. My mama taught me that you can glorify God in anything. But I was pretty clever. 
when I was 12 years old. I was, I was sharp. I'd been to Parkwood Baptist Church. I learned my Bible. <laughs> and so I said to my mother, like the disciple, well, Mama, can you glorify God washing dishes? And she turned around and looked me right in the eye. She said, yes, son, you can. Yes, son, you can. You can glorify God in anything. You can see God at work in anything if you'll look. The question is, are we looking? Are our eyes open? Can we see? And I believe we can. I believe we are. I believe we will. Amen.